This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help keep this channel running and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. Remember this, this is the night Biden won the election about one million years ago. For many Americans, specifically on the left, that night in November 2020 wasn't so much a victory as a little sigh of relief. A sort of, we won, Trump lost, we lost, Biden won kind of deal. That very night, the left started preparing its opposition to the new president. But then, the US got hit with a couple of the weirdest months the country's ever seen. Trump didn't like the look of the results, and so the entire Republican apparatus mobilized behind Stop the Steal. A massive scramble to try to find votes, overturn election results, take people to court, run defamation campaigns in the media, basically anything and everything that could produce even a single shred of evidence that the election was somehow fraudulent. It failed. The whole thing culminated in the events of January 6th, and then nothing. We mostly stopped hearing about it, and it all kind of faded into the background. But that was a legitimately strange thing that had happened those few months. We should reflect on that a bit more. This video is going to take everything that we learned from those couple months and ask, what about next time? Specifically, what happens if Trump runs again and loses? This isn't going to be a Trump is bad video. You're smart enough to know that already. And this won't be a Biden is good video either. That's not really my vibe. In fact, forget both those topics. This video won't even really be about politics, per se. At least, not things like political programs and policies. Today, I'm going to be looking at some of the lingering structural effects of the Trump presidency, and the corridor to the White House he has built for himself, or really any determined far-right candidate. Because although Trump may not have been a literal fascist in every sense of the word, he has, perhaps better than any other president, laid the groundwork for full-fledged fascism to take root at the highest level of American government. Let's get into it. As I'm writing this, it's way too early for anyone to announce they'll be running in the 2024 election. Still, Trump is the preferred candidate for the Republican Party by far, with over half of conservatives wanting to see him run again over literally anybody else. The next best candidate, according to a survey by Ipsos, is Ron DeSantis, at a little tiny baby boy 11%. And that statistic is really the first piece of the puzzle. Not the Ron one, no, that one's just funny. Trump's commanding 50%. The first way Trump has given himself the opportunity to quote, steal the election, meaning take presidential powers even if he's not the winner of the electoral college vote, is by getting a lot of public support behind him. But not just any kind of support a support that is specifically anti-democratic and centered around the idea that electoral institutions are manipulated by some anti-Republican establishment at the very last second to push a Democrat through. Somewhere between 60 and 80% of Republicans think the 2020 election was stolen, and only around 30% of Republicans said they would trust the election results if the candidate they support loses in 2024. As we saw last time, that kind of widespread belief led to events like January 6th, and the general desire on the right for a more authoritarian form of rule. As I've already explored in another video, this specific idea that the election was stolen by the Democrats is one of the biggest factors contributing to the popularity of fascism in the American right, and the desire to bring it about by force, swelling the ranks of far-right groups and giving more radicality to conservative discourse. The big lie, as that election is sometimes called on the right, has been one of the main ways that far-right groups have brought more casual Republicans into their ranks. And the number of Republicans who have held on to that belief hasn't really budged in the last year or so. Clearly, Trump has maintained a large base of angry and distrustful conservatives since Biden's victory, meaning he could activate it again. More on that later. First, we need to talk about American democracy. Look, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like the US is even a decent democracy. The institutions suck, the electoral college is garbage, most media outlets are owned by a handful of the country's wealthiest people, just two very similar parties dominate the entire political landscape, first past the post always leads to lesser of two evils tactical voting, and the kinds of decisions that affect most people's daily life, specifically around production and working conditions, are arbitrarily left up to unelected, unaccountable property owners. And those are just some of the big ways American democracy is awful. But there are still some things about it that are worth preserving, both as an end in themselves and as stepping stones towards a more complete democracy. Things like the outcome of a vote being the thing that happens, and fascism not being the government's ideology. Our election system is horrible at every stage of the process, and hardly qualifies as democratic. But it's not outright fraudulent as far as we can tell. 
And yet, the feeling that it is dominates the American right, and could be used, as we see elsewhere in the world, to make an already weak democracy even weaker. Because far-right governments couldn't care less about voting, this basic component of democratic life which, for all its limitations, still offers a modicum of institutional power to the general population. And we know that because we've seen this far-right anti-democratic urge all over the world. It's in the program of French far-right leader Marine Le Pen, who, had she been elected, was ready to dissolve the parliament and give her party a majority of the seats with only a plurality of the votes, thereby rendering it entirely useless and allowing herself to rule entirely through referendums and plebiscite. That same urge is in Orban's Hungary, where gerrymandering, control of the parliament, the courts, the media, and, since the pandemic, so-called emergency powers have secured Orban's complete executive dominance. And we don't need specific examples to prove this point. It's at the very core of the far-right's ideological program, regardless of its specific execution. The goal of the far-right is always to exclude, as much as possible, those it considers the outgroup, usually racial or religious minorities, and anyone who sides with them. When the far-right gets into power, however they do it, it is always in the hopes of curtailing democracy, both in general and especially against those its scapegoats. But back to 2024. The second way Trump has given himself the best shot at contesting the election successfully is through the judiciary, and there are a couple different parts to that. In the immediate aftermath of the 2020 election, Trump's team filed dozens of lawsuits challenging the election results in key swing states, like Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. None of these ended up working, even when the judges were appointed by Trump himself. But that doesn't mean it's a dead strategy. Several of the cases were thrown out not because the judges had strong opposition to hearing them out, but because the Trump campaign did not file them properly, they simply filed too late, or the cases did not involve a significant enough number of electors to be considered worthwhile. Tweak those variables just a little bit, say by having four years to get ready and hoping the uncertainty margins are larger, and suddenly taking election disputes to court becomes a viable strategy to overturn the whole thing. Especially when the people you appointed are still hanging around. But that's not all. Now, the third strategy at Trump's disposal is the electors themselves and their certification. This part is a little technical, so I'll do my best to simplify it. Basically, when you vote for presidential candidates in the US, that empowers electors to actually vote for that candidate on your behalf. That's the Electoral College. You don't really vote, they do. For their votes to count, they usually have to be certified by your state's governor, who normally looks at who wins the popular vote in your state and certifies the electors from that party. The problem is that the governor can send the wrong certification to the government if they want to, regardless of what the popular vote in their state is. Meaning if your state turns blue, the list of certified electors can be red. When that happens, it's not like a cheat code where votes don't matter and now governors decide, but rather the whole thing is considered an election dispute that needs to be resolved, specifically by various legislatures and state delegations to the US House tasked with that responsibility. What the Trump campaign has done with this information, and is liable to do again, is pressure Republican state certifiers, governors and other local figures, in key swing states to get them to certify the wrong electors specifically to trigger this kind of settlement. The hope being that that settlement goes in their favor. Ultimately, this stems from the fact that a lot of American electoral institutions are reliant on convention a lot more than on specific rules and procedures. And one thing to remember throughout all this is that although Trump and the far right are more likely and have shown more willingness to use these strategies today, it's not like that's the only possibility. Any presidential candidate from any party, gee, I wonder who I'm talking about here, could use these same strategies for the same purposes. This isn't some exclusively Republican strategy. None of these are. These are structural problems. Yes, governors and other lower-level officials with strong far-right attachments still have the certification responsibilities they had last time around and can use them to trigger disputes. But at the end of the day, it's not that Trump created institutional bias in his favor for the next election. Although he staffed or gave external promotion to people who support his cause, all the building blocks of his strategy were already there. His most lasting impact wasn't that he changed a bunch of stuff, quite the contrary. More so than previous presidents, he was willing to use everything the American governmental system provided to keep his hand on executive powers. And if it failed the first time, it only revealed where he could push harder the next. While this video hopefully gave you some insight into Trump's past and possibly future strategy, the main thing to remember isn't the technical details or the fact that the certification process creates disputes that need to be resolved by some special official or whatever. 
All of these methods are not ends in and of themselves, but strategies to create as much legitimate doubt as possible in an already distrustful electorate. To multiply the angles of suspicion so that if and when legal cases fail, disputes are settled in favor of a democratic candidate, or cases of fraud are revealed to be nothing but lies, they all appear to reinforce the idea that Republican voters are being targeted and disempowered, making all the more legitimate the desire to try and install Trump or a Trump-like figure by force. Basically, Trump can't lose. He doesn't need to win a bunch of legal disputes to score a victory. Regardless of how disputes get settled or judges rule, the very fact that results can be contested in this way will play up the doubt that Trump has been nurturing since his very first campaign in 2016. He will be able to mobilize a lot of angry people for very bad, incorrect reasons if he needs to. And what he might do with that is terrifying. The consequences of a second, more radical far-right term would be devastating. And if global trends are to be trusted, more difficult to upend than before. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that my content is supported by my patrons on Patreon. For those of us who make principled socialist content, it's pretty hard to both find good sponsors and fight the YouTube algorithm. Without my patrons, this channel would not exist. If you'd like to help keep Second Thought afloat and snag some cool perks while you're at it, consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Every patron, regardless of pledge amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to our patrons-only Discord server. The Discord is a really fun place to hang out. We've got a book club, a recommended reading list, and I try to do a live Q&A with patrons every month, which is always a good time. So, if you'd like to help support my channel, join the Discord, and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash secondthought. It really does help support me and my channel. That's all for this week, I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.